Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week on the Garden DC podcast, we're joined by Andrew Bunting. He is the Vice President of Public Horticulture with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks thanks for having me. We are going to be talking all things hydrangea today, but before we dive into that, I wanted to ask a little bit about you and your background and i know that you were with atlanta botanical garden chicago botanic garden but i have to ask the question we often ask on the garden dc podcast which is andrew were you born with chlorophyll in your veins (laughs) uh yeah probably uh from from a a relatively young age like my, my mother uh who lives in new jersey now she uh she always gardened and then as a kid, I think that's how I got attracted to it. I also had two, both my maternal and paternal grandfathers were both farmers, one in Illinois and one in Nebraska. So I think that probably influenced me in one way or another. And then I was lucky enough to go to a high school that was was pretty big in the northern suburbs of Chicago that had actually had some uh, I think three different horticulture classes in high school. So that kind of piqued my interest. And then uh, I went to a little junior college, Joliet Junior College in Northern Illinois. And it was through there that I I had to do two internships. And my first internship was at the Morton Arboretum, which is west of Chicago. And the other was at the Chicago Botanic Garden, which is north of Chicago. And it was through those internships that I really fell in love with uh, kind of the public Uh, horticulture field. And as you mentioned, I I currently work at Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. Prior to that, worked at Atlanta Botanical Garden. Prior to that, Chicago Botanic Garden. And then for a long time, I worked at the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College, where I was there for, uh, I think, 27 years in in total. Looking at your your resume, I see that you did internships in New Zealand and Somerset, England. Can you talk about those a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. I uh, actually, I came to the Scott Arboretum in 1986 and worked for three and a half years, but it had always been a dream to to work uh, at uh, so, somewhere foreign. So uh, when I was at the Scott Arboretum, I met uh, Penelope Hobhouse, who's a world famous garden designer, has written many, many books on garden design, color in the garden, uh, all, all sorts of horticultural books. So she was given a lecture at uh, the Scott Arboretum probably in the late 80s. And I must have had a conversation with her. And she said, you know, why don't you come over to England and work with me at Tinton Hole House? So she was living at Tinton Hole House in Somerset in the southwest of England, uh, which is a National Trust property. And because she was doing so much lecturing and writing, uh, she hired me and another uh, young American to help her in the garden. And then I had also had a friend who had been to New Zealand and he met uh, Gordon Collier, who's a, a really well-known uh, garden garden designer there who had a garden on the North Island in Taihapi called Totoki Point. So I corresponded with him, and this is long before the internet, and he said, you know, if you if you want, you know, when you finish up your stint in England, which was about, I think that was about 10 months, he said, you know, if you can make it to New Zealand, you can come and work with me for um, three months. So I did that. I, I left England and then flew to uh, New Zealand and spent three months there and then ultimately came back to Swarthmore. So I'd, at that point, been gone o- over uh, a year in total. And uh, I did a number of things. And actually, uh, kind of the first job to kind of restart 
back in the Swarthmore area. I worked at Chanticleer for about a year and a half when it was transitioning from a private estate to a public garden. And did that experience gardening overseas? And then I, I would call New Zealand way overseas, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> would that have changed the way you garden? Did it? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, it really, it opened my eyes to kind of, you know, incredible breadth of garden style. So one of the things I did when I was in, in England is I bought a car, a used car, and every almost every single weekend I would go to whether it be National Trust Gardens or private gardens or Royal Horticultural Society gardens in mostly in England, but also in Wales and Scotland. And I think I counted that I went I visited 140 gardens in in that 10 months. So I saw everything from, you know, kind of wild Robinsonian type gardens, shade gardens, plantsman's gardens you know, Tudor style gardens, you know, formal, informal, uh, you know, grand estate type gardens and, and, and so on. And then when I went to New Zealand there, I, you know, I, I would say the style was either kind of an English style or kind of a, a more of a wild kind of natural native New Zealand garden style. So both in England and in New Zealand, are, you know, my eyes were really open to kind of uh, the depth and breadth of plants in general. Because like in New Zealand, they can grow everything from, you know, Mediterranean plants from South Africa or Chile or the Mediterranean, or they can grow a lot of, you know, more northern, uh, you know, cold tolerant temperate plants. So, you know, I really saw such a variety of garden styles, but also realized that, you know, the plant world is vast. And I met a lot of, you know, serious designers, you know, it was that, that year in England that I met, uh, uh, well, I lived with at Penelope Hobb House at, at, at Tinton Hall House. I met Rosemary Vary, Christopher Lloyd, uh, Pam and Sybil, who were the head gardeners at Sissinghurst at the time, John Brooks, Nori and Sandra Pope, who were at Hadspin House at the time. So it's like I, you know, I met, met, you know, what's still considered today kind of the who's who of, of um, gardening uh, dignitaries in, in England. So that, that was, that was amazing as well. Those are the names of many legends yes. in gardening. And many of us will be like, Huh, turning green with envy right now, Andrew. <laughs> that yeah, you got the to meet only all person I didn't meet that I wished I, I had met when I was in England, and he was still alive at the time, was uh, uh, Graham Stuart Thomas, who mm. you know, had ri written those great books ma mainly on uh, perennials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it sounds like you did not let moss grow under your feet. <laughs> no, you, no. You, you took advantage of yeah, all it, those learning opportunities. Yeah, it was a full horticultural immersion uh, that, that year. Before we dive into hydrangeas, I want to also ask about your home garden currently, and then maybe talk a little bit about a typical work day at PHS for you. Okay, sure. So I, I live in Swarthmore, uh, which is where the Scott Arboretum is. So that's, that's how I kind of ended up there. And I've owned my house, which looks like just, um, uh, like a little English stone cottage. It's about a third of an acre, uh, which is small, but big enough for me. And uh, it's gone through many, many transformations and kind of iterations of gardening over the years. Like the front was kind of a cottage at one point, cottage garden, and then it was kind of a wild meadow-esque garden. And now it's a gravel garden. So that's kind of my newest garden. The garage I turned into kind of an indoor, outdoor space that I call the summer house. Uh, in the back, I grow a lot of unusual annuals and tropicals, both in containers and then in, in the beds as well. The very back is a woodland garden. And about 10 years ago, I approached my neighbors with the idea that I would create this uh, fairly large vegetable garden in, in their uh at the back of their property. So we live on Vassar Avenue, so we call it Vassar Farm. It's 40 by 100. It's big. It's four 
kind of quadrants. Um, there's chickens back there. Uh, there's compost. Uh, there's some really gr- great uh, Asian per- um, persimmons that are pretty bountiful in the fall. Uh, I would say, if anything, I enjoy collecting plants, but I, I also enjoy garden design as, as much as I do uh, the collect, collecting of uh, unusual plants. So, you know, when I left, I, you know, I went to Chicago Botanic Garden, Atlanta Botanical Garden. I was gone almost five years. I kept the house. So it was kind of fortuitous when I got this position at the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society that I could just kind of move back into my old place. And um, Josh Cacciano is a horticulturist at the Scott Arboretum. He lived there, so it was in good, pretty good hands while, while I was away. So I guess that takes us up to, uh, we call it PHS, or most people around here call it PHS, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. And, you know, one of the things I do love about my position there is that every day is, is different. I would say there's no uh, typical day. My kind of my purview is all of our public landscapes and public gardens. So, you know, a typical day might be, uh, you know, when we're uh, typically at our offices, uh, we've been working from home for the most part, would be to go out and maybe go to some of our, our, public spaces that are nearby. So it might be going to say the Azalea Garden or the gardens at the Rodan Museum or the Philadelphia Museum of Art or Logan Square, maybe over to the gardens at the Eastern State Penitentiary. And then, you know, I'd probably have a meeting, you know, meeting or two. Nowadays, it's lots of meetings. Um, You know, in my position, I get involved in a lot of things like, like, like this podcast. I do a lot of uh, media type work, whether it's uh, an interview for a podcast or, you know, I just gave a lecture for Smithsonian Gardens on hydrangeas and did one uh, prior to that on, I guess that was magnolias. Uh, and then I do a lot of writing too. So I write a local every two weeks for the local newspaper, the Swarthmorean, that has now been somewhat uh, syndicated. And then I do another one uh, monthly for uh, the New Jersey Gardener, uh, which is for, it's a free paper, but it's given away at garden centers. And then I do one for for Ball Publishing for Green Profit. I think that's quarterly. So, you know, I'd say, you know, part of any day would probably be some some media related work. and then, then I have a team that a small team that oversees our pop up gardens. So we have two gardens that uh, are in Philadelphia that also have a, a food and beverage partner. So they're kind of a restaurant and a garden combined. And then I have another team that um, uh, oversees uh, kind of urban design. So I would probably be involved with them at some point in any given day. And then we also, where, where I am today, is we have a public garden north of Philadelphia called Meadowbrook Farm, which is an old estate garden. So depending on the day, I might be up here uh, as well. And because I'm um, uh, vice president of public horticulture, a lot, you know, I would say almost anything that has to do with ornamental horticulture, a lot of either that involvement, whether it's with our education team, which we call audience engagement, I might get be involved with them on a project or, or, or something. Um, we do have a whole team that's more kind of um, uh, vegetable gardening through our community gardens team. So they would handle more of the uh, community garden, vegetable gardening, subject matter, kind of expert aspects of PHS. So, um, you know, it, it can, it, you know, or it might be a donor meeting. It can, you know, any day is, uh, I would say always different and a- always really interesting. Hmm. And I am a big fan of those pop-up gardens. Oh, good. I think the name is so funny though, because I feel like all gardens pop up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> some of these, you know, mm-hmm. the, the original idea with the pop-ups is that they were to be kind of a one-year ephemeral garden and then just, you know, they'd be done at the end of the year. And then 
we did those for a while where they were true pop-ups. And then our new model is if, if it can work out to have a, this, you know, a restaurant partner. So they also become good fundraising vehicles for PHS. And then they're also really interesting gardens. So the one at South Street is more, let's say that's kind of urban chic with lots of tropicals. And then the one in Maniunk is at the base of an old kind of rusted uh, train shed. And so that one's more uh, uh, Pennsylvania na native ecosystems we have over there. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't been to the, the one with the natives. I'll have to check yeah, that, that out this summer. Yeah, that opened in the... I guess in September of last year. Hmm. Okay. Something to look forward to yeah. this summer. And we'll be talking about the other big late spring, early <laughs> summer occurrence, the the Philadelphia Flower Show in a bit. Sure. But now let's focus on hydrangeas okay. and everything about them and all their relatives <laughs> and, and all of that stuff. And we're going to cover that right on our podcast in half an hour, right? All right. Let's do it. <laughs> It's going to be a race through hydrangeas. I was going to say, it's, it's only a tiny topic or something. So um, to start off with hydrangeas, maybe let's focus on the native ones to yeah, start. Yeah, How about that? Yeah, that's a good group. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, most people, when they think of hydrangeas, think of the big uh, ball-shaped ones, which are called hortensias or mop heads, or the, mm -hmm. the, you know, and they also come in the lace cap form. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a lot of great native hydrangeas, so... Even in our areas around, say, Washington, D.C. or up in the southeastern Pennsylvania area, if you went out into the woods, you would probably come across a species called hydrangea arborescens, which is the, called the smooth hydrangea. And that actually, it'll grow in deep shade, but actually flowers better uh, the more sun you give it. So you've probably, you know, probably the most ubiquitous and for good reasons, because it's probably one of the best hydrangeas on the planet, hydrangea. Arborescence Annabelle is a selection of the native smooth hydrangea. It has beautiful white flowers. And both hydrangea arborescence and hydrangea paniculata, which is an Asian species, bloom on new wood. So that means that uh, you, could, you could either just leave them as is and not prune them, and then the, the shrub would just gradually get a little bit bigger each year. Or like when, we're, when I was at the Scott Arboretum, we would prune them back to maybe six inches or so in March. It sent out all new stems up to about four feet tall. And then in July, you would get these big uh, white heads. And Annabelle is great because it uh, starts out kind of lime green, goes to pure alabaster white, fades back to lime green. And then those heads turn kind of a tawny brown, which can be ornamental uh, for, for the winter. And it's also super hardy. Like Annabelle is uh, probably one of the uh, most commonly used hydrangeas in the Chicagoland area. Um, you know, I would put it, I would put in my top five hydrangeas and I would probably put in my top 10 shrubs, uh, period. Just because, mm -hmm. just because of the long bloom season. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was, it was theorized that there, that, I mean, it, kind of the holy grail of the hydrangea world for a while was to create a pink Annabelle. So Tom Rainey, who's a famous uh, plant hybridizer with North Carolina State University, but works in Western North Carolina, he um, kind of charged some of his grad students to go out in the woods and see if they could just find uh, a native hydrangea grown in the woods that, that just had the slightest amount of pink. And they figured if they could find a pink one, they could do a, a number of back crosses and, and continue to pull out that um, pink or accentuate that pink color. And that's where, that's how Invincible Spirit was de developed, which is an arborescence. And now there's a whole series, kind of Invincible series, where there's ones that are kind of the original soft pink to ones that are really more kind of a, a almost like a, a purplish burgundy Pink. So kind of the whole range from light mm -hmm. to, to dark. And there's probably about six of those. Yep. And, and then, of course, everybody wa wants ones that are shorter. So there's a, a new one called Limetta, which is kind of a diminutive form of, of a Annabelle. So, you know, Annabelle has always been a great hydrangea. And now there's been this breakthrough with uh, 
kind of Invincible Spirit series, uh, Limetta. And then there's also one that, that an, one of the drawbacks of Annabelle, although to me it's not that big of a drawback, is a lot of people don't like when they're in flower and we get, say, a thunderstorm and they tend to splay open like a pe- peony might kind of splay open. Mm-hmm. So what was also suggested is that maybe somebody do some hybridizing to make one with more sturdy stems. So there's one called Incredible, which has a, a flower head that's even bigger than Annabelle. It's like the, the size of a, a, a man's hand. And um, it's, uh, you know, probably, you know, like six to seven inches across. Uh, and it has strong, strong, supposedly has stronger stems. So it, it doesn't tend to splay open like Annabelle m- might do. And Annabelle tends to splay open more if it's grown in a bit of shade. If it's in sun, the, the stems seem to be a little uh, stronger. Yeah, and I've been trialing, uh, when you talked about the Invincible series, I have Mini Mauvette. Yeah, which is, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a pretty neon pink. It's, pre- yeah, it's pretty yeah. close to that end. And then I also have Wee White, Yes, which, yeah. which I just got, and that's a tiny white one, and that's more pure, pure white, whereas Annabelle is almost, I'm going to say, towards the ivory end yes, of white. Right, that's right. Mm-hmm. And then, there, you know, there are other arborescence cultivars. There's a double one called Haze Starburst. Uh, there's, a, there's some people call them a different species, but, uh, hydrangea arborescens radiata, which is sometimes listed as a subspecies. Those have kind of a whitish underside of the leaf, which is, uh, pretty. Uh, so there, there are others. Those are kind of the ones that you mentioned and I mentioned kind of, uh, are the breadth of hydrangea arborescens. And then the other native that people uh, really like is the oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea mm-hmm. quercifolia. And that's not truly native in our area. You have to go more f- farther south into, say, uh, G- parts of Georgia, northern Florida, Alabama is where you would see uh, hydrangea quercifolia truly growing in the wild. Again, it's a, in, the, in the wild, it's a, a native understory plant. But again, if you bring it into more sun, you get better flowering and then it's called the oak leaf hydrangea because the leaf in fact looks kind of like a red oak leaf and then it also gets really good fall color kind of a reddish purple uh you know most hydrangeas just turn kind of yellowish brown in, in the fall so it's it's good for that it does not bloom on new wood like um arborescence and paniculata so i would say if you need to prune it just kind of judiciously prune it don't do any severe pruning to it uh, depending on the cultivar, it can get, you know, fairly large, you know, say eight feet tall, eight feet wide. Uh, there are many cultivars. My favorite, a uh, handful of favorites would be Snow Queen, which um, has really nice upright white, uh, you know, cone shaped panicles of flowers. Uh, Snowflake has these kind of hose and hose and hose double flowers. That, that make them so heavy that they become a uh, pendant and hang downwards. And that's really a nice hydrangea to grow kind of spilling over a wall. Uh, there are some more diminutive types like uh, peewee and Sykes dwarf and uh, Ruby slippers. Ruby slippers is an uh, inter- introduction from uh, the U S national arboretum in Washington, DC. And it's, mm-hmm. um, it's small, kind of, you know, maybe three to four feet tall. And then the white flowers ultimately turn kind of a carmine pink. Uh, and then there's another one that kind of quickly turns to pink called amethyst, uh, which is really nice if, if you can find it. And then there's a, a, a small one that has yellow leaves called little honey. Uh, and little honey, for that to be successful, if you give it too much sun, it turns green or actually scorches, I should say. If you Mm -hmm. give it too much shade, it turns green. So what you really want to do is give it kind of edge of the wood woods or dappled sunlight, like under say a a honey locust or a Kentucky coffee tree where it's not a a deep shade. And then you really get that vibrant kind of butter yellow color coloration to Mm -hmm. the leaves. Um, But like all the, you know, hydrangeas in general have got, there's probably no 
shrub in my lifetime that has gone through such an incredible renaissance in the gardening world then hydrangeas and it all happened i don't know 20 something years ago when martha stewart featured hydrangeas on the cover of uh, her magazine martha stewart living and it was from that day forward that the world of hydrangeas really exploded and it's you know, if you look at any of these groups, whether it's har- arborescens, the oak leaves, paniculata, macrophylla, serratas, they've all like had this kind of rebirth and there's been incredible plant selection and hybridizing work that's that's uh, continues to happen. Like we um, actually, Rick, Richard Hockey, who's at the, he's the manager of plant evaluations at Chicago Botanic Garden. He did a hydrangea paniculata trial in like, you know, 20 years ago, maybe you could find five cultivars, maybe, of hydrangea paniculata. I think his trial had over 75 cultivars alone of hydrangea paniculata. And with uh, back to the oak leaves, there's probably, if you were to collect them all, there's probably at least 30 cultivars of oak leaf hydrangea. Well, thank you, Martha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yep. And and I was going to say uh, no thank you to Madonna. I don't know if you remember that press conference she gave a few years ago where a fan came up or somebody came up and gave her a, an armful of, I believe it was blue hydrangea right. blooms. And she was like on mic live and under her breath, she says, I hate hydrangeas. She was uh, like, uh, and she kind of throw, tosses them behind the yeah. table type of thing. Well, well, and it, I was like, it, yikes. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, that comment does not seem to have uh, affected their popularity. <laughs> no yeah and everybody was bewildered by that i was like who hates flowers yeah, exactly and, and they're such long lasting uh vase life if you do cut yeah, them fresh yeah yes. and then it, it dry dry the, you know well, that's as well yeah mm-hmm. and yeah. that's pretty much infinity vase life right there for dried yeah yeah for sure and they actually like hydrangea arborescens or, or paniculata they're they're kind of dried flower heads in the garden you know will last well into kind of the next spring. So they, they also have kind of a staying power if you if you choose to leave them on the on the plant for winter effect. I'm a very much a procrastinator in snipping off last year's blooms, especially on the smooth uh, hydrangea. I leave them practically till the new ones have formed. <laughs> and then yeah, I go right, and, right. Yeah. yeah. Me too. And, and they're almost <laughs> like, you know, little skeletons at that point, yeah, but yeah. they're still there. They're still marking where the blooms <laughs> were. Um, so I do want to talk about uh, some of the climbing hydrangea sure. family. So are they actually directly related to hydrangea or is just that the well, name well, climbing it, hydrangea? You know, that's, I haven't stayed completely up with uh, the taxonomy of hydrangeas, but there's been talk and I, I believe a lot of people now are, putting almost everything that's in the hydrangeaceae family in the genus hydrangea. But for the, for the climbers, there is a, a, hydra, a true hydrangea, hydrangea uh, petiolaris, which is, um, it has little rootlets along the stem that allow it to cling to whether it be a tree trunk or a wooden fence or a, a cement chimney. And it grows skywards and it has kind of lace cap flowers where it has more kind of showy kind of four-parted florets around the outer edge of the flat top cluster and then in the center it's all the tiny fertile flowers where the seed would actually come from and it has a really um kind of uh kind of uh hand soap uh sweet fragrance and it has a beautiful kind of golden uh yellow fall color Sometimes it takes a while to bloom, like it can, it can need to be uh, seven to 10 years old before it really gets uh, good flowering. Mm-hmm. And then there is kind of a native version of the climbing hydrangea. It has a different genus called Decumaria. So it's D-E-C-U-M-A-R-I-A, Barbara. And it, um, it's found in southeastern parts of the United States, comes up into Arkansas and southern Illinois, and I actually saw it fairly recently growing in Alabama, and it was growing in standing water in a swamp, which is not a condition I would have thought it would tolerate. And it has, um, instead of having the showy flowers like you have on most 
uh, hydrangeas, it's all fertile flowers. So it's kind of a dome of flowers, also fragrant, blooms in the summer, really fantastic kind of, kind of almost like a ghostly, kind of uh, whitish, yellow, creamy fall color, self-clinging as well. I have uh, on the front of my house, I, I have a De Kumaria Barbara. And actually in the, in the back of my house, and I'm sure I'm the only one in probably Pennsylvania that has one. And I got this from Heronswood years ago. I have the Asian counterpart to that. I have De Kumaria Sinensis. And that, hmm. it looks very similar. It just has a slightly narrower leaf. And then there's uh, my favorite of that whole group, and it's a, it's a mouthful, is uh, Schizophragma hydrangeoides. So that means it's hydrangea-like. And that's hmm. called the Japanese hydrangea vine. And it, um, so if you give it good sun, it flowers better. And there's a cultivar called Moonlight. Like if you're going to, I mean, the straight species is nice. And what it does is it has get a, kind of a flat top cluster of flowers. And then it has these single bracts that kind of, they almost look like they're hovering above or suspended above the flower or the foliage. They're almost kind of these like teardrop uh, bracts. And so that's really pretty. If you grow the one that's called Moonlight, it's claim to fame as it has those flowers, but it also has kind of this variegation where the, the leaf is kind of a pewter silver, but then the, the veins are, are dark green. So it creates this kind of beautiful mosaic effect on these heart-shaped leaves, self-clinging. The, the key with Moonlight is if you give it too much sun that the variegation doesn't stand out but if you give it too much shade you don't get as good a flowering so what i found is the probably the best place to grow it is maybe like i had one actually in the northwest corner of my house and kind of that aspect got it got enough light to kind of do, it, well, it was shady enough to to give the good variegation and sunny enough to give the good um flowering and then uh there are if you live in like england there's another another genus called pileostegia vibranoides but that i've tried it here and maybe in places like the like san francisco or the pacific northwest you could grow it but i i don't believe it likes the the heat and humidity of um of the most of the eastern u.s and do you find so you said it takes seven to ten years sometimes for the flowers that climbing hydrangea are really slow to establish and get started on that climb yeah i would say they actually climb pretty quickly it's this and it's more with the hydrangea petiolaris that the the flowering seems to be delayed with schizophragma flowering can be uh pretty um pretty, pretty earlier when it's fairly juvenile and same with the De Kumaria. So it's, it's really more the, what, what most people call, um, the climbing hydrangea. And so moving on to the big family, the mop head type yes. or macrophylla, um, you mentioned the heat of the East coast. And of course here are heat and humidity in the mid Atlantic. Do you find that for though that group that we have smaller or less flowering, say, than they get in Michigan or Long Island uh, from those mop heads? Um, I would say not, not necessarily. I think it, it's a tricky group. And there's, I think the things that people need to know to understand why, why they're going to get flowers or not uh, are a couple of things. One is so hydrangea macrophylla is, is the group of the the mop heads and the and the lace caps. There is hydrangea serrata, which is kind of a Japanese version. That's everything's more diminutive. Um, is there's probably a thousand cultivars. Uh, they'll actually take a lot of heat. Like the you know American Hydrangea Society is based in Atlanta, and there's there's not many places in the country that are hotter and more humid. Than Atlanta, but the hydrangeas do really well. That they do, they do do well there. I think hydrangeas generally, while they can grow in alkaline soils, really can thrive in um, in more of an acidic soil. 
the key in, in real hot places, say DC South, is to uh, hydrangeas will actually do better with a bit more uh, shade, and you have to really be mindful of of watering during periods of, of drought. Uh, for people in in where it's colder, and that that can sometimes even include, say, the Philadelphia area, is not all hydrangea macrophyllas are created equally from a, a hardiness perspective. So uh, you have to you kind of have to know which ones are 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 hardy enough. So like in Chicago, a lot of the macrophyllas just did not do well at all. They may have survived the winter, but what off, often would happen is they would die. They would be frozen to the ground. Mm. And because most hydrangea macrophyllas, you need uh, stems that are at least two years old to get you know, satisfactory flowering. They always had new wood, so they never really produced flowers. Now, there are some newer clones like Endless Summer and others that bloom on, on new wood. So that, that is a breakthrough in the hydrangea macrophylla world. Now, there, is, there does seem to be a perfect kind of uh, climatic sweet spot for hydrangeas, and that is kind of a, a, a maritime type situation. So I've, I've never been to Nantucket, but uh, there's some uh, hydrangea growers there. And I've seen pictures of like a hydrangea macrophyll that's literally like 10 feet round and, you know, in t- the entire thing is covered in flowers. Oh. And I, I go to Martha's Vineyard quite a bit because I have a, a colleague there and uh, macrophyllas do really well there. Uh, as do the serrata types. And what's interesting, and I'm sure the same, same is true as on Nantucket, is Martha's Vineyard is ex- one of the most acidic places probably in the country where the pH can be, you know, 4.5, 5. And so all the, you know, all, all the hydrangeas, it could be blue or pink, are all blue. Like they are like an intense, uh, really intense blue because of mm. the acidity, and that's another thing to kind of uh, uh, kind of hydrangeas one hundred and one that people need to know is uh, uh, the the flower color is dependent upon the pH. So if it if it could be pink or blue, anything say six point five or less pH, you know, on the acidic side is going to be blue, and anything say six point five seven or higher is going to be pink. Like in Chicago, you know, high alkalinity, high pH soils. Uh, the water also has high pH. So, you know, most of those hydrangeas there are pink. And places like Martha's Vineyard, they're all going to be blue. If it's a white uh, hydrangea, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't go, you know, it doesn't really turn a, another mm-hmm. color. Uh, so that's, that's important to know as well. And you, you can augment the soil, make your soil more alkaline or, or acidic and try to change the pH of the soil and thus the, the flower color. Like the Scotter Buretum, which is more on the acidic side, uh, we bought, this is years ago, we bought a hydrangea called Forever Pink, a macrophylla. And it was pink the, the first year and then Forever Blue the, the <laughs> all the years uh, forward from that. Yeah, I totally relate. I bought Blue Jeans. Yep. hydrangea and it was blue the first year and pink for ever since uh, because of i'm in an old brick house and i'm and i'm pretty sure it's it's the brick that makes the makes the soil alkaline yeah exactly what often happens is uh people that plant them along their foundation you know most foundations are made out of cement and the cement the mortar of the cement or just the, the how the cement is made has uh you know a, a high level uh, level of alkalinity to it so that's why often foundations are have a high uh, ph um you know so that that and it it does uh, it can impact the the acidity or the ph of the of the soil mm-hmm. and then the, you know the other group that's worth mentioning are the hydrangea serratas so serratas are like like a macrophylla they both have lace cap and the, the mop heads are hortensias, but everything is, is smaller in stature. So the plants themselves can be anywhere from like three to six feet tall, smaller leaves, smaller flowers, great for a smaller garden. 
And many of them have uh, Japanese names like Miyamiye Murasaki or uh, Kiyosumi, or there's a, a several several others that are you know can be available either through mail order or a bit more of a specialty nursery. But what's great about that group is they have incredible hardiness. So if you live in places like say you know anywhere in New England, Chica- Chicago, Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin. They become a great alternative for the macrophyllas, which there's, I would say there's a lot less hardiness in macrophylla than there is, than there is uh, hardiness. That's a great tip. And yeah, I was going to say that we always want what we can't have, right, right. Andrew? I, I want that bright sky blue hydrangea, and that's just not going to happen for me without, <laughs> not, without a lot of work. <laughs> And then I, I have neighbors who are like, how do you get your hydrangea so pink? And I was like, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in our last few minutes together, let's talk a bit about the changes this year to the Philadelphia Flower Show and what people can expect. Right. So uh, for the first time in 190 uh, something years, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society is almost 200 years old, and the flower show has been running fairly regularly since our inception. It will be out of doors. It's almost, you know, at least for the last 20 years or so, it's been in the uh, Pennsylvania Convention Center in the winter. Uh, but because of COVID-19, we've decided to have it out of doors at, at FDR Park, which is in the southern part of Philadelphia. It's right near our, the stadiums and just north of I-95 and close to the uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard. So it's, you know, it's a great part of the city. It's in a 300-acre park that's an Olmstead Park, so same Frederick Claw Olmstead who designed Central Park. So it's, a, you know, it's an old, grand, beautiful park. Uh, we'll be taking about 15 acres of it, so that seems relatively small, but it's actually bigger than, than where the footprint of the the normal flower show. Uh, it'll be open June 5th to the 13th. Um, you can go online and get uh, timed uh, tickets. It'll be, you know, at a time of year that we don't, don't typically have a flower show. So in June, so a time of year where there'll be, you know, you'll get to see a lot of, th- a lot of uh, I think, a bit more, more diversity of plants because of that and, and just having more av- availability of plants from a, a wider range of nurseries. There's a, over 75 exhibitors that the theme is habitat. So however, however the, the exhibitor or designer might interpret that. And that I think there's quite a bit of latitude for, uh, for, for interpretation. It all sounds really exciting. And the 15 acres that you mentioned makes me think I might pack a change in shoes <laughs> yeah yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't wear uh i would wear comfortable shoes so it will be out of doors there's going to be a lot of great uh, uh food venues kind of scattered all over uh the site and the the park itself has uh, some water features so there's a kind of a classic old boathouse that has these beautiful palladian arches so that'll that'll be Kind of an episode, or a, uh, I should say, a fo- focal point at one end of the flower show. Um, there'll be a design district and kind of a plantsman's district. There'll be a lot of vendors that people are familiar with, but also some new vendors that will be highlighting plants for sale. You know, uh, when we do sell some plants at when it's at the convention center in the winter, but again, we're limited because of the time of the year. So we have more opportunities this year to have kind of a wider uh, or more breadth in the type of uh, plant nurseries that we, um, that we um, uh, can, can offer at the show. Yeah, and I'm taking a, a busload of Washington Gardener readers up. Oh, good. And we have the entire underneath of the bus that we can fill up with plants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, been, I've been on bus tours like that. It's great because the undercarriage of a bus has quite a bit of space. Yeah, and the fact that you can buy what you're seeing basically on display does yes. make yes. the the outdoor and the June timing even more exciting for this year. Yeah, I, I think it's it's to me it's really exciting. You know, it's something we've never done. So, uh, you know, that 
we we have a good idea of how it's all going to turn out, but it, I think it's actually going to be even more spectacular than any of us could could uh, envision. Because mm-hmm. I think that there's just going to be so much. Well, one, I think people in general are going to be so excited to be doing something that uh, seems uh, you know nor- more nor- normal, and it's going to be out of doors. And uh, so I think there'll be a good buzz about the the flower show. I agree. And I think so many of us are just ready. Yes. We are past ready. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And things, things are moving in the right direction. And, and, you know, people are feeling more safe to be uh, out of doors in this type of situation. So I I think it's, uh, it's, I think a lot of positive things are all coming together at the same time. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, PHS, for, you know, powering through and putting on a flower show at all this year. So that will be great. And also thank you for sharing your hydrangea tips and wisdom. And for some final thoughts, you had mentioned there are almost a thousand, right, introductions in the macrophylla. And, you know, I feel like I've been sent dozens of them to trial. Uh, Are there a few of the new introductions that you recommend? Yeah. Yeah. You know, to be, um, you know, tiny, let's, I find out to get the right name, but tough stuff is one that's more kind of, uh, uh, you know, again, more of a compact form. Um, so I, I like that. Um, I, you know, I must, you know, be honest and say, I don't, I don't even have a macrophylla type in my yard. What I've really gravitated towards, and it's a group we actually didn't even talk a lot about are the paniculatas. So the panicle hydrangeas is one of my favorite groups because they're tough as nails, can grow in full sun. I still like, it's been around a while, but it's 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 a great clone called Limelight. Mm-hmm. But now there's a newer one. So if you, if you need something that's a bit smaller for the yard, one called Little, Little Lime. Um, so I like that as well. And there's one called uh, Little Little Lamb, I think, as well. Uh, but there's also been breakthroughs in that group where there's ones that are more more pink, like Pinky Winky, which has probably been around for 10 years or so. And there's other kind of pinkish clones, whether they kind of start out pink and stay pink or they start out white and, and fade kind of a, a, a deeper pink color. And who can resist a name like Pinky Winky, right? right. Exactly. Yeah, that, was, <laughs> that was really good marketing. Very good. Uh, so thank you for those suggestions. and. Looking forward to seeing you in June at the Flower Show. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Brunnera plant profile. Brunnera macrophylla, or Siberian bug loss, is also known as the false forget-me-not due to its dainty blue flower sprays in springtime. The flowers are pretty, but the real reason you want this plant in your garden is that it is a perennial workhorse with many positive attributes. In fact, it was named Perennial Plant of the Year in 2012. This plant's foliage is rough textured and heart-shaped. The hairy texture of the leaves make it deer and rabbit resistant. It is not a native plant to the Mid-Atlantic USA, but it is well-behaved and expands in a clump that can be divided and moved about every few years. The only maintenance need is a fresh application of organic mulch in early spring and to cut back the spent flowers, unless you want the plant to seed about a bit. Brunnera needs to be kept well watered in its first year, but after that, it's quite drought tolerant, making it a good choice for dry shade locations. It's also a great alternative or companion to other shade-loving foliage plants like hostas, heucheras, and caladiums. The old-fashioned Brunnera is straight to green, while the newer cultivars have a silver sheen or white variegation to their leaves. That makes this plant shine in the deep shade. These include Jack Frost, Looking Glass, and Silver Heart. There is even a chartreuse version named Diane's Gold. This versatile plant is a good ground cover as well as container plant. Brunnera, you can grow that.
What's new this week in the garden? Well, over at my community garden plot, the strawberries are starting to ripen. I've gotten a couple handfuls so far and expect to have many more next week, maybe even enough to, to make a strawberry shortcake or make a jam. We'll see. And the weather has been pretty dry and hot. So the cool season crops are on their way out. I'll be pulling out the broccoli. I'll be eating the last of the radishes and probably the last of the arugula and other lettuces. Some of the radishes I'm gonna leave in to bolt. That means set flower and then form seed pods and then seeds. And if you check out the new issue of Washington Gardener Magazine, May 2021, you'll see an article I wrote on the bonus harvest of radishes. So they're edible at all of these stages from baby seedling through to seed pod. So check out that article and you'll want to let some of your radishes stay in the garden and bolt too to get some of those bonus harvests from them. And back in my home garden, I've received a few more boxes of sample plants and one of them I was ecstatic to see included the ingredients for a knockout martini. This is the petite knockout martini, which is made from vodka, sparkling pomegranate beverage, and fresh lime juice. That sounds really yummy for a weekend treat. And I will be finding some spots and containers for those petite knockouts to go in. I also have a uh, trialing several annual plants and some veggies and some basil so I'll be reporting back in future podcasts of how those trials go. I'm really excited in particular for a couple of the annual dianthus and the uh, wave petunias that are in colors that I like (laughs) which means lots of purples right because I am a purple girl. So upcoming events in the local gardening area for the DC, Maryland, Virginia, greater mid-Atlantic, if you're in my region, uh, check out Gardens of Note. That's the Reston Garden Tour on Saturday, June 5th. And you can find out information about that and purchase your tickets online from Reston Corral. Um, that's C-H-O-R-A-L-E dot org. So as you can tell by that name, Gardens of Note, it is a, a music and garden tour. So it's a self-guided tour, including pop-up musical performances. That sounds like a lot of fun to do that afternoon. Another upcoming tour is with the Potomac Rose Society. They're having a tour of the Franciscan Monastery Rose Gardens and a group picnic, uh, Bring Your Own, uh, afterwards if you want to stay and meet up with the Rose Society members. And then I am giving a talk for Fairfax County Park's Green Spring Gardens, and it is on attractive and lasting plant combinations. That's Saturday, June 12th at 11 a.m. And there's a nominal fee to about $18 per person. I think there might be a discount for the frogs, the Friends of Green Spring, but check that out. And you can find out more information and register through fairfaxcounty.gov slash park slash park takes. And the event code is cdv.ok4p. I believe that is the correct code. You can also just search on my name, Kathy Jentz, J-E-N-T-Z, or on uh, Green Spring Gardens um, event site. So I also wanted to note that I've been doing a lot of garden touring myself and been posting albums of photos from those tours to the Washington Gardener Facebook page. So if you go to facebook.com slash Washington Gardener magazine and click on the photos and then the albums, you'll see albums of photos from um, several of the recent garden tours that I've been going on. And uh, the latest one is the Beyond the Garden Gates garden tour that's in downtown Frederick. It's a self-guided walking tour And you go to CelebrateFrederick.com to sign up and get the online brochure for that. And that goes through Sunday, May 23rd, if you're interested in still catching the Frederick Beyond the Garden Gates Garden Tour. Happy gardening!
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.